Good morning, everybody. Um, I, some faces I haven't had the privilege to meet yet. Um, my name is Bob Miller. I'm director of public works. And got some training that I, I need you all to be aware of. We've got a, uh, a fairly straightforward task, and that is to take wastewater from homes and businesses, have it travel through pipes to a wastewater treatment plant where it's treated, and once it has been treated, uh, to return that water back to the environment. The uh, process of doing so is heavily regulated by the federal government as mandated by the Clean Water Act. Because we have got a, an, an older urban system, we have a number of challenges in doing that. And when the system fails, it fails in what's called sanitary sewer overflows that uh, take what's inside of the pipe and should have stayed inside of the pipe and instead put that out into the environment before it's been treated. The system that we have here it has got a number of challenges that we haven't been able to uh, uh, completely handle. And as a result of that, the federal government sued us. And uh, to settle that lawsuit, we had to enter into a consent decree. And that consent decree contained a whole number of promises of what we will do to, in order to ultimately reach compliance with the Clean Water Act. One of the promises that we made is that we will report every occasion of a sanitary sewer overflow. And even if it is uh, one that happens all the time, even if we don't have the resources to get to it, even though whatever the reason is, we have to report every occasion, every time. And so with that, what I wanted to do is have you all receive some training and we're going to get this training out to other people, but we wanted you all to have it next as far as what is our expectations on reporting those sanitary sewer overflows. Um, guys, that, uh, one of the things that I'm proud of you all about is that I believe that you all do the best you can with the resources that have been given to you. My job uh, is fairly straightforward, and that is to go out and create more resources and get that aligned so that you can do an even better job. And so I readily acknowledge that you all are doing the best you can with what you got. But for me to get more resources, the first thing I've got to do is convince the federal government that we're doing everything we can with what we got. And the fact of the matter is we don't get to decide what's most important to them. They get to decide what's most important to them. And what they have told me when I've met them is the number one thing that is most important to them is that they know that we know when and where the sanitary sewer system overflows. And so today's training is very straightforward. Here's what our requirements are. Here's what we need you to do. And so with that, I will leave you to the tr your training. I'm uh, leaving to meet with the mayor on some other pressing matters in support of this. So hope you all have a pleasant time. Uh, and uh, what I'm, bottom line is, and you'll hear me say this at every training, what we're training, on, training you on today, we need you all to be doing tomorrow. Okay? So thank you for your time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are y'all today? This is uh, it's titled SSO Report Training or Procedure Training. It's a little different than most of, the, and I'll try not to wander around too much, Lewis. A uh, little bit different than some of the SORP training, which is uh, sewer overflow response plans. It's a little different from that. This is more procedure. Um, so we'll get started. I, I always like to put this manhole up first because this is a, obviously an SSO. It's a pretty significant SSO. Does anybody know where it is or where it was? 
Did we, remember whose property it was on? <laughs> no. You must you must know one that I don't. I'll have to go back and look through some reports. Where'd you say, Dan? Right off West Sherrill Road, by the Square Lakes. Yeah, that's whoop. that's it. Uh, I always called it Billy Munger's manhole because it was on Billy Munger's property. <laughs> um, it's pretty significant, uh, significant overflow, and it was caused by excessive flow, uh, but it was also partially caused, if I remember right. We were having some problems at the treatment plant at the time, and in order to fl uh, keep the treatment plant from becoming a big sewage pond down there inside the levee, they had to restrict the flow. This is where it backed up, and that's 10 miles from the treatment plant. Uh, 2011. I was trying to make out the, it's the, it's the 10th, I can't remember the month, but I think it was a March. Uh, Anyway, pretty pretty exciting time when that happened around here, especially since we were in the middle of negotiations with <laughs> EPA on the consent decree. We'll move on. Like I said, it, the the SSO reporting in in what we do now actually started with uh, an excuse me an agreed order with uh, DEQ back in 2010. <coughs> Back during that time, it was a, uh, a, a perceived and probably reality uh, deficiency in the city of Jackson's reporting and, and more so in the record keeping of that reporting. Uh, that agreed order led into the development and implementation of the sewer overflow response plan uh, or SORP, uh, which I think you all have copies of, and if you don't, you will get an emailed copy after this presentation. Uh, that was in 2011. Uh, during that same time, uh, from 2010 to ultimately 2013, the city was in negotiation with DEQ in the, or in EPA on the consent decree. Well, when Part of the consent decree when it was um, finally effective March 1st, 2013, it incorporated elements of the agreed order from 2010 as well as the specifically the sewer overflow response plan. And that is actually an exhibit to the consent decree, uh, exhibit E. And like I said, I'll, I will email April or, or we'll get y'all all copies if you don't already have one. I know it's a couple out at sewer maintenance. <laughs> um, but anyway, the SORP dictates, you know, what's inspected, what's, how everything's reported, what's reported, uh, all of that. And in previous training sessions, we've always kind of focused on, on the SORP. Uh, this is a little different because um, Actually, it's a requirement in the permit that you do this reporting. And the NPDES permit, which is National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, is essentially the city's uh, uh, operating permit uh, granted by the federal government to operate a sewer system. And if you don't have a permit or your permit gets withdrawn for whatever reason, it, it's it's pretty bad because if the city can't operate a sewer system, nothing works. <laughs> Everybody leaves. Uh, some specific um, uh, permit conditions. This is S1. It's non-compliance, and it's the 24-hour reporting requirement. Uh, and I'm not going to read read everything it says, but it basically says that um, one when you first become aware of the situation an SSO, you have 24 hours from that time to verbally notify, and it says orally, but I like verbally, uh, verbally notify DEQ of that. That's what 
Carolyn's dispatchers do. When the crews go out, they confirm the SSO, she does her thing, they actually notify uh, Warren Hudson with DEQ. The other part of it uh, is, dang it, is the five day reporting and that's the written report. So after the crew goes out and does what they do or find what they find, Dan and the supervisors all check everything. Carolyn emails it to Linda. Uh, Linda then sends it to DEQ. And that's the five days. Uh, so everything's going pretty good. Now, this S1, um, and this has probably been more recently, I don't know how far back, but um, an SSO is an unpermitted discharge, meaning you don't have a permit to do it. Uh, the, I'm off. They specifically say under this reporting requirement, any sanitary sewer overflow. So that's, that's one of the conditions uh, in the permit that the city has to comply with. They value SSOs so much, they actually put a section in specifically for SSOs. So once you go out, you get a call, and um, when you do your 24-hour reporting requirement, which also includes the five-day written follow-up, you, okay. You know, on that report, you have the cause, the duration, volume, description, all of that. We call that the um, SSO assessment or wastewater asse overflow assessment form. And I think everybody probably around the table has seen one, but here's a hard copy for those that haven't. Uh, just take one and pass it around. That form contains all this information plus a little more, um, but it does meet uh, all these conditions on this. And you'll, you'll see one other, one other thing, uh, particularly is this section H or paragraph bullet H, whatever. Corrective actions or plans to eliminate future discharges. That's, that's really what EPA wants. They want to know what actions you took and if it's going to correct the problem in the future. There's obviously a place on that form for that. And the last permit condition, and apologize, it shows up a little better. T31 is a duty to mitigate. Permittee shall take all reasonable steps to minimize or prevent any discharge, sludge use, or disposal in violation of the permit, which has a reasonable likelihood of adversely affecting human health or the environment. When sewer gets on the ground or in a ditch, it has the possibility of affecting human health, without a doubt. If it's in a ditch, if it's really in the front yard, and the permittee, who is the city of Jackson? It's not the city of Jackson Public Works. It's not the sewer maintenance division. It is the entire city of Jackson. Police, fire, even planning, I guess. Uh, so those are the three main, which I think are the main permit conditions that we're here to comply with in order to, for the City of Jackson to continue to operate its sewer system. There are other things that I'll just touch here too, just for those that don't know. The city also has to report bypasses, and that's that's the whole another section there. And bypasses basically is any flow that's diverted around the treatment process itself, the mechanical plant. Uh, those of you that's been to Savannah know the big we call them storm cells. Some people erroneously call them sludge storage lagoons, but um, anyway, what happens when flow exceeds the plant's capacity to, 
to treat the city has, and, and it always has, as long as I know and probably as long as Kelvin knows since he's a lot older than I am. Um, <laughs> when flows exceeded the plant's capacity, they diverted into these storm cells. Now, the, the thought at one time was that these storm cells would hold that peak flow and then it would be brought back into the plant. And when it, these storm cells were, were modified, uh, when the plant was built, they actually put, a, put an influent and an effluent so you could bring it back. Well, what, what happens is the lagoons get full and maybe during an extended time, um, they still can't bring the flow back. So that flow is discharged out uh, is brought back together with the mechanical plant's effluent and it's, it's basically blended and then it's discharged to the river. Well, EPA um, and DEQ, DEQ probably for sure, uh, says that's an illegal discharge in their opinion. Um, so those bypasses have to be reported as well. So just all right. So to meet all of those three permit conditions, we're here. We have to properly report the SSOs, clean up and minimize any environmental effects, and prevent occurrence for future SSOs. And we we put this regain the trust of regulatory agencies because you know in several meetings with EPA, and I Mayor probably was in some of the meetings, they don't believe we're reporting all the SSOs that occur. Well, you know, I, I contend we are reporting all the ones we know about. Does the city actively go out and look for them? Anyway, so what we're, we're here to do is to uh, basically these, these three, big three items, and then hopefully we can get a little more trust with the, with the uh, <laughs> regulatory agencies. All right, so what we need to do is actually look at our procedure to, um, we're going through the report and uh, we'll pass these around. And this, this is a work in progress. Uh, I think everybody's got one, so you can make notes on it, make improvements, suggestions. Uh, like I say, because I think the, the, the overall goal is, is to make it work, make it work smoothly. <clears throat> so we can, or Mary, or Director Miller, or whoever's sitting on the witness stand testifying can can testify that uh, yes, we follow this procedure and we're reporting every SSO we know about. Um, oh, we've talked about the consent decree. Consent decree obviously has some stipulated penalties in it uh, for the number of SSOs and uh, days uh, or events you bypass. Uh, these three permit conditions, the NPDES permit actually has a whole section in the federal rules and regulations that talks about penalties. And those are separate and apart from anything that may occur as part of the SORP. Uh, Y'all can write it down if you want to, uh, or we can do it. If, if you look in what's called 40 CFR 122M, uh, there's some pretty serious penalties for violating a permit. I'm not talking about violating consent decree. I'm talking about violating this, any, any of these. Uh, 
There's civil and criminal penalties, and there are and there is jail time associated with some of them, particularly as it, if it deals with negligence or uh, other things. So. All right, per permit condition S1, which is 24-hour reporting. Um, just kind of restating on the previous side slide. Uh, you have 24 hours from the time the permittee, the city, becomes aware. You can, it actually says, again in the permit, it says orally, I put verbally. You can either call them, we prefer to email. If you email, you've got a record of it. If you got a phone call, somebody may not fill out a phone log or whatever. So email, email's good. And the second and equally important part of the 24-hour reporting requirement is the five-day written report. And again, uh, all of these are part of the, the requirement in that permit condition S1. Uh, our wastewater assessment form uh, covers all of that. One thing we're probably, well two things we're probably lacking some that we need to improve on is um, one, adhering to that five days. Uh, the last SSO report that we received uh, from Linda was on the 17th. One of those reports, the SSO was verified on the 10th. That's a violation. That has to happen in five days. You know, if, for instance, I know there have been a occasions where printers have been down and different things, waiting on stuff, you know, uh, I've told Carolyn, anytime that happens, call me because we can figure out a way to get, get past that. But one thing everybody in this room needs to be conscious of is if it's not received by DEQ in five days, that's a violation, period. That doesn't say five calendar days either five days. So if it occurs on the weekend, or that five days falls in a weekend, are they going to get that picky about it? I don't know. They don't trust us very much now, <laughs> so they may. Uh, so anyway, what I've, I've started to put together was, was basically just this, this procedure uh, I guess from the way I see it, the way I understand everything is, is working or supposed to work now. And some areas where I think we can maybe change up a little bit that might, might improve that reporting time. Uh, and one, one thing I do want, do want to back up and, and tell particularly Dan and, and Teddy and Terrell. Uh, you know, most of the crews are filling out the reports, for the most part, pretty, pretty complete. You know, there, there are a few here and there, you know, that may have a piece of it missing information, but it, you know, it's a lot better, and I think, than it was two years ago, and I think it's still continuing to improve. So I think, I think that part, you know, of the whole reporting process is, is is going pretty good, but for those that that don't know or whatever, we're just kind of going to start walking down the uh, workflow that I passed out a little bit ago. Service request for service, I think, is the appropriate term in 311 now, isn't it, Carolyn? Is it re is it service request or request for service? on the 311 initial call service request. Okay, I got it right. Service request is received. That is uh, entered into the, or com comes from or entered into the 311 system. Uh, SSO reports are received, basically, well, can be received from a number of 
places, but primarily through 311 or direct calls to sewer maintenance dispatchers. If it's a direct call to sewer maintenance dispatcher, then it still gets in the 311 system. So 311 is kind of the data, the master database of everything that's supposed to happen. Uh, get the request, the crew is dispatched to the location. Once the crew gets there, the first thing they do is either confirm it's an SSO or it's not. And obviously we're focused right on this as if it is an SSO. So SSOs confirmed uh, are verified. Um, crew notifies the dispatcher that it is or uh, SSO is or has occurred. And like Carolyn said a while ago, uh, then the dispatcher or her or somebody uh, Let's Warren Hudson know. So obviously all that happens hopefully within 24 hours, which looking at the uh, assessment form, it has a place for DEQ notification. And uh, I would say if that doesn't happen within 24 hours, it's 99.99% .99 of the time it happens within 24 hours. Okay, once the crew notifies that the SSO is or has occurred, the crew takes immediate steps to stop or minimize it. Um, so what, is, what does that mean? Man, oh, sewer lines choke, they clean it, you know, whatever they have to do at that time to, to eliminate it, hopefully, uh, but for sure minimize it. Then, is the SSO issue resolved? Okay, we're going to say it was a choke line in, in this case. So the line's cleared, uh, crew fills out their paperwork, they complete the SSO form and they give it to the supervisor at the end of the day. Do y'all always wait to the end of the day or some of them turn in during the day or? But anyway, certainly all of them by the end of the day they're turned in. All right, after that, the it's turned in, supervisor and or superintendent reviews them, uh, make sure they're, they're accurate, they're complete, uh, and then the superintendent turns those in to the maintenance division office coordinator, who is Ms. Carolyn. Now, by missing any steps or, or saying something that actually doesn't happen, feel free to stop me. And make a note on your workflow that you have. I, I have one comment. Okay. Okay, so SSOs are not emailed to me. They are brought over to me. We you're, have a you're, thing. you're getting ahead of me. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, once the super, superintendent provides the maintenance division office coordinator, Ms. Carolyn, uh, the reports, this is a change. That, and like I say, at this point, we can kind of talk through this. Um, but I, th I think it's a, a place or, or a step in here that maybe we can speed up the time and the reporting time a little bit. Uh, what I have is, is Miss Carolyn scans the reports and emails them to the utility manager and who is Bill and the utility division office coordinator who is Miss Linda. Um, how would that work, Carolyn? I mean, could could that work? You know. That way, you know, you, you think the crew goes out today, uh, they get in this afternoon, they turn their reports in to the supervisor. Uh, supervisor looks at it, Dan looks at it, it's okay, they give it to you, and you could scan it and email it. So you're, you're looking at two days, maybe three at the most, unless it happens on the weekend. 
Would that be better? Save some paper, too. But, you know, some people like to keep paper records and electronic records and any records they can. Um, speaking of records, which I didn't think about till now that we were just talking about, the permit as well as the consent decree requires that all records be maintained for five years. So you should have all SSO reports, we should have all SSO reports for the past five years. I don't know if you dump them by the month or whatever, but we don't ever get rid of them. Uh, we've actually got SSO reports in our <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, our database at Wagner going back to October 2010 uh, when we first uh, first started working on the, the SORP. We started, started collecting the SSO reports at that time um, and we do scan them. We have hard copies as well. Um, we can Carolyn, we can we can talk or, or Tracy or Sharon Sharon Johnson and Tracy Milton. Tracy Milton's in our office. Sharon Johnson's is in the AJA office, and they both uh, Sharon is doing most of the database entry uh, SSOs and QAQC in them. Once we get them, uh, Tracy Milton uh, handles most of the mapping and tracking of the SSOs. Uh, she's the one that actually develops and, and will continue to develop uh, Donnell's repetitive list as well. So um, when, when we get ready to start scanning and emailing them, I want to get uh, those two ladies and you and, and, and perhaps me together and we can kind of work, work out that because uh, and Linda knows the file naming structure which we basically use file names is is the 311 number Linda Linda also adds to that or has been adding to that the date because we're doing follow-up reporting now which we'll get to in a little bit uh, if you have well I, we'll get to it a little bit I'll get ahead of myself okay once it, it uh, <clears throat> is received by, by Linda and Bill. The utility manager uh, in, in the SORP actually needs to review that. Uh, and I say utility manager, it's utility manager and or collection system engineer, which is a vacant position, um, or engineering manager. Some, somebody collectively needs to review those and approve them before they go to MDEQ. Yes, yes. Um, you know, another, another thing that, that helps with is, and, and, and Dan and Teddy and Terrell and uh, Bill, you know, we, we've been tasked with putting this, <coughs> well, several lists together, but one we call a sewer failure list, the location of all the the known problems in the sewer system around. So Dan had some, Carolyn probably had all of them, probably the best list. Teddy had some, everybody had some, you had some, Charles had some. So one thing this procedure will do, will, will bring everybody together so everybody will be aware of where all the problems were, or are. So, Utility manager reviews them and approves submittal to DEQ. Once he's approved them, Miss Linda will do her thing. She will send those written reports on to um, DEQ and she will upload them. And we have a like a Dropbox, we call it share file, whatever, that we get them as well. Um, and then we do our thing and what DEQ does with them they file them, I'm sure. So, from time dispatcher provides verbal email notice to the time Miss Linda 
he mails them to DQ. How many days? Wrong. That's up to $25,000 a day plus one year in jail for violation of the permit. Kelvin. Yeah. yeah. All right. As the is this five days, that's something that they put before us, or is that the That's in the, per we're not even talking about SARP or CD right now. This, this is strictly the NPDES permit. Yeah. Question, which portfolio we have to send to We got to do that. Do I know? Who's going to do the 24 hours? Mm -hmm. Now, remember when, when Carolyn was talking about uh, what what their role was, or what her role was? They they provide the verbal notice to DEQ. Oh, the jail time, twenty four. Oh, I thought that was a year minimum of a year, twenty five thousand dollars a day, plus a year in jail. Uh, one year, and that's minimum. Up to twenty-five thousand dollars a day for violating permit. Who we have to do the year? Whoever they find guilty of violating that permit. It could be Dan. It could be Kelvin. Could be you. That's right. Yeah. And falsifying records is actually. Criminal and it, it's, I mean, it's folks are doing jail time for falsifying records. <laughs> I mean, serious jail time. So, but we don't falsify records, we report what we see. Right? Right. Um, any questions, comments, suggestions, changes? Question, you just up here, I don't know you have it or not. Well, it's it's a sur it's a service request because they get service requests. They get they get requests all the time. You know, they they actually would get a service request and get their you know the request may be, um, and I've seen these before. Uh, I need somebody at 422 Broadmoor Drive. The manhole in front of my house is overflowing. Crew gets out there. It ain't any evidence that it's overflowed or has has overflowed the last five days. So, what do they do? They they pop the manhole top and look, and if it's down and running, you know, probably just say down and running. I don't I don't think you would go ahead and shoot manhole to man or jet or manhole to manhole just because you were there. Mm -hmm. That one just runs until it stops. That one just runs until it stops. <coughs> but it has to be reported every day. Has to, yeah. Every day. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably a good place to take a break, get some lunch. Y'all keep on eating. I'm, like I say, I just, we'll, we'll go ahead and get through the second part of this. But I know y'all got a whole lot of things you need to be doing instead of sitting in here, but this is probably the most important thing you need to be doing today. Yeah. Just another day. All right. Well, cut it on, David. Second part uh, of this is the reporting of ongoing or unresolved issues, which seems to be uh, increasing <laughs> with sewer lines falling in all over the place. Not all SSO causes can be resolved at the initial response. Like I say, a lot of times you go out and crew goes out, it's a collapsed line. So, uh, Chances are you're not going to be able to either repair that line or set up a bypass pump within 24 hours. 
uh, or that same day. What the crews do uh, in, in that case on the uh, assessment form, uh, since you have to give exact times and dates, and remember we have to have durations too, uh, they fill in the date and time the overflow began, but then in the uh, time ended, they put ongoing, which means obviously it wasn't resolved at that visit. Um, so, going back to permit condition S1 in the 24 hour, uh, Reporting, you do a description and its cause. If you know the cause at that time, sometimes you don't know the cause, you just know something. It could, pipes broke down, could be a big old root ball in there that you can't get out, you know. But most of the time, you, the crews generally know, uh, know what the cause. How do y'all know the cause, Teddy? Now that your mouth's full and I ask you a question. <laughs> Or Dan, either one. You run the jet truck out. Well, yeah, but but, but yeah, but maybe that that initial response when the crew goes out, say say they can't 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 get the nozzle all the way through. And, Well, I, <laughs> so Dan's the best operator you best operator you have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So on those, those unresolved issues, um, like I say, they do the same thing basically we always do, except you have to, should include the anticipated time it's going to continue. So you may have, you may go out, um, you know it's going to be an ongoing issue. You're going to have, it's going to take you you know, bypass pump be set up tomorrow. And, and a lot of the, the notes are to that effect on, on the report. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes different calls have to be made. But, uh, whoop, back up. Why? So you have to have a sense of urgency. I agree. Does volume, when, when you're reporting or responding to an SSO, does volume as far as reporting goes matter. In other words, is it, is it some minimum amount before you have to report? No. no. Don't matter if it's a cup full or 10,000 gallons, you got you got you have to respond and minimize the the impact on the environment regardless of the volume. Now granted if it's only a cup it's a little easier, to, <laughs> a little easier to minimize that. But uh, had a guy at DQ once tell me it didn't matter if it was a, a teaspoon or not. If it was out of the system, we were to respond immediately. He's retired now. Matter of fact, I went to. He was my first boss when I left the city. Uh, Barry, yeah. 
Um, you also are, are to report the steps taken or, or planned to take to reduce, eliminate, prevent the occurrence of the noncompliance of the SSO. So, starting off again, uh, top of the workflow, same thing, service request, crews dispatched, uh, SSOs confirmed, same thing, there's a 24-hour crew notifies the dispatcher, dispatcher or Miss Carolyn notifies Warren at DEQ. Goes on down, crew still takes whatever actions they can to stop or minimize the SSO. Then they get to this point, is it resolved? Could be a broke down pipe, could even be a, a service lateral choked. It could be occurring on private property. That's something we hadn't really talked about, but we do SSO reports wherever they occur. Because sometimes when, when it's occurring on private property, it may be strictly on a private property, maybe a private property issue, uh, like a nursing home. Um, um, you know, in that case, pretty much know, I think, the cause and who's causing the problem, uh, but we still have to report it. Um, could be sewer, and which DPA questioned on the last, last report we gave, uh, there were several SSOs and the source was a clean out. They wanted to know, okay, you say it's a clean out, are all these really caused by problems on the city sewer system? And the answer to those was yes. City, city reports all of the SSOs, whether they're private or public cause, their causes are either private or public, reports all of them to MDEQ. On the consent decree, they don't report, we don't report the ones that are on private property and are caused by a problem on private property. Because the consent decree and EPA from like I say, from the consent decree standpoint, they're really only interested on problems on the city's or the public sewer system. You still have to take actions on what should happen when one of the operation and maintenance programs get going, it's called the private lateral program, is once the city determines that a problem had, an SSO has occurred by a problem on a private lateral, then the city will take enforcement action against that property owner to get their private service lateral fixed. So some of these, uh, trying to think of one right off the top of my head besides the nursing home, the manhole behind the grocery store, uh, Kroger. Uh, there were continue, uh, I forgot how many follow-up inspections w were done on that, but that was private property. So what, what would happen when you determine or your crews determine it's private property, the cause is by failure on the private system, then that SSO or 311 call would be turned over to whoever's going to do the enforcement on the private lateral program. Year, years ago, we used to turn them over to the health department. Okay, this SSO issue is not resolved. So, it's not resolved. The crew, and I left crew off, I'm sorry. Crew notifies the supervisor that it's an ongoing issue and then the crew completes that, and we'll call it the initial SSO form because it's ongoing, so it's not obviously not completed. Um, this is happening, I know, because I've seen on SSO reports <laughs> notified PW101 or 
call the supervisor or call Bill Miley, Dan Thomas, uh, you know, so this, this part's happening. So, supervisor also lets, I, I know he do, lets Dan know, who lets Bill know you've got an ongoing issue? Do you do that, Dan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's the only time that you let let Bill know you've got an ongoing issue? Well, he gets, uh, he gets the, when, uh, when they send an email, when they send an email. I'm sorry. This is my bad ear, so I couldn't hear both of you. So. Oh, okay. He gets the alert when it goes out to us and that. Yeah. And who sends that alert out? Dispatch. Dispatch. Okay. <laughs> Y'all ever email addresses or anything like that? Any, any way to document it? Other than our master failure list? So, so you are aware of all ongoing or unresolved sewer system issues that you know about. Okay. Hey. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'm. At this point, all of this is happening. Uh, supervisor or or designated personnel following up on the unresolved issue. One thing that, that we haven't been so great about in the five-day report is submitting to DEQ along with those ongoing SSOs is scope, schedule, and resource list to repair it. Because remember, we went back to uh, in the permit condition, you give uh, an anticipated length or duration that the SSO will be occurring. Uh, one thing, if you'll notice at the bottom, or kind of close to the bottom, uh, under your permanent corrective action, if applicable, is the itemization and schedule. That's the schedule of the repair. Um, and that's really something I think that Bill and Dan need to get together on, you know, and decide at that point. You know, because like I say, maybe, you know, I'm getting a little ahead of myself again. You know, y'all may get together and, and Dan says, hey, I'm stretched out. I ain't, you know, three backhoes are in the, in the shop. I ain't got nothing to work. If, if you're lucky, only three's in the shop. Uh, you know. <laughs> so y'all need need to obviously do that, and then obviously that will come down to this decision. Um, you know. You know what it's going to take. You come up with, you know, a reasonable schedule that you can give DEQ and say, look, we know we got this one going on. I don't know, Lynch Creek. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is how long we think it's going to take. You know, Bill and Charles would get together. And I picked on Lynch Creek because it's a big one. And, um, so then you decide whether you're going to do the repair with city forces or contract. Uh, contract forces are whole different area that's going to be under development depending on term bids and however that gets approved. But, uh, say on this, this case we go to, okay, Dan and Bill and Charles look at it, um, said, okay, well, we think, we think Teddy can fix this one. So, 
then assigns the crews and uh, they begin the work. You should be given uh, Miss Carolyn through Dan uh, progress reports. Uh, depending on the length of the time, and this this is something that that Dan, Bill, Charles, whoever would have to talk to um, Warren Hudson about. Sometimes they want weekly progress reports. If it's bad enough, sometimes they want daily progress reports. So that would, uh, whether they want it daily, weekly, whether the director wants it daily. I mean, you know, he likes bad news, I think. So any, any good news would be a good thing. So whatever the frequency is for those progress reports, then those should too all funnel back through Miss Carolyn, because remember you want to keep everything associated with that 311 call together, so you will have a, a history. Uh, and I think City Works is actually supposed to let you do that. I don't think that's been fully implemented yet, but which would make it a whole lot easier. Uh, so that way you could see the, the entire history of every call you get, including the cost. So, And back to the, uh, again, to the far right-hand side. Goes through Miss Carolyn, sends the to Bill. Um, Bill reviews it. That way he's updated on the progress too. And then uh, Miss Linda currently would email that report to DEQ and program management team. And then we would continue our part of the consent decree reporting based, based on that. And I think Jennifer said earlier, um, you know, when consent decree started, the city had to do quarterly reports. Uh, particularly for SSOs and bypasses. Uh, <clears throat> after the last couple of meetings with EPA, and uh, they, they're now wanting to conduct monthly progress meetings because as uh, Mr. Miller said earlier, you know, we're trying, we're doing the best we can, but we ain't doing everything we're supposed to. So EPA and DEQ wants to have monthly progress calls, which essentially means that we're, we're the city that, you know, everybody are doing monthly semi-annual reports because it, it covers everything, not only SSOs, but all of the operation and maintenance programs that we're uh, undertaking or need to be undertaking uh, anyway kind of a but everybody knows where everybody's at Yeah. And so, I mean, seriously, bypasses and SSOs of all the things that are occurred, and of course, our, you know, we are going to say this to financially meet all of the consent requirements. But that aside, the biggest two items are the SSOs and bypass assets. And they're zero again, like we did for the Spending this time with you because it's just so critical. That we don't make, and, and, and let me tell you, I've only, I've been here exactly three months and one day, I can say. <laughs> but in that period, we've had residents calling EPA headquarters in Washington, okay? We've had people calling MBEQ. Sometimes they don't even call the city, or maybe they call and they didn't get a response, or maybe the response wasn't what they wanted. But we uh, have had to address Two weeks, three weeks ago, a couple of those in headquarters. You cannot imagine how that turns around people. <laughs> to have to hear from headquarters that somebody's calling and complaining about a very local situation. So 
We're not just the business of going to jail and the penalties. The penalties are very real, very real. And all of us as taxpayers ought to be very mindful of that. Uh, <clears throat> the intent is not to send anybody to jail, but uh, let me tell you that on any report that is sent, uh, Bob Miller, who signs off on it, for example, and I believe the mayor as well, tell us what, what that disclosure says in, gen in general. Thank you. I'm glad you said in general. <laughs> it uh, <laughs> basically says that by signing this certification that uh, it contains accurate information and it was prepared by uh, personnel under under my review or under my direct supervision. So what, kind of getting back to Donnell's question, when, when the, the director and the mayor signs that certification, they would be the first ones to go to jail. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll include that certification as well. Um, there are, every report, um, Every document that the city has submitted as part of the consent decrees on the city's website. If you look at the links on the left hand side, it's uh, wastewater consent decree documents or something like that. You can go to that and, and look at look at any of the any of the reports. Uh, or you can go to www.cojcd.org, I think it is, is the direct link. Um, but like I said, it, it's I, I was I was looking at some uh, <coughs> wastewater treatment plant information this morning, um, going back to I believe May of 2013, which was a couple of months after the consent decree started or was effective. Uh, they're just in bypasses. Not saying there was any environmental harm or damage to uh, or damage to the environment caused by these bypasses, but 15% of the total flow going into Savannah Street was bypassed around the mechanical treatment plant. That is over 13 billion gallons of and I will say partially treated because I still believe it is partially treated even though it's a bypass. And every one of those bypasses didn't cause a violation of the discharge permit, but it was bypassed. My, my next task is to go back and look and see how many millions or billions of gallons was bypassed through SSOs out of the collection system. Don't think it's going to be that much, but maybe we had some we had some big ones. If you notice on my first slide, and that wasn't the only one like that that happened early on. So, but anyway, everybody knows what their role is, or why they report, or why we report. Uh, have any? Oh, excuse me. I left this part out again. How many days? That is the max. Uh, so under, I guess we've already talked about some because that's what two, four, five, six. I think we've had our our number of questions that are lighted. So, uh, any any comments? Any questions? 